So I'm going to throw a little warning out here. There are multiple instances in this video where there are parts of certain MVs and stage cams and some other footage that I use that does have some flashing lights. So if you're sensitive to that kind of stuff, I would recommend not watching this video or at the very least proceed with caution. I do a lot of subjective interpretation of Aizawan's concept and music in this video. You can easily come to different conclusions about their music and their concept. The analyzation that I do on Aizawan's concept and music is purely subjective and I don't want to portray it as objective in any way. The great thing about music is that we can all take different things from it, so feel free to share your opinions about their music down below. I'm going to open up this over hour long analysis of Eyes One and their music with my honest opinion about the group. During my fledgling years as a K-pop stan, I got to see Eyes One debut and grow over their short stint in the industry, witnessing the birth of one of K-pop's most iconic groups of all time. They cultivated such a massive loyal fan base in such a short period of time, which has extended past their disbandment. I feel as if K-pop has become so popular that many newer fans just recently getting into the industry don't know how inspirational this group really was. Just like how the SNES came before my time, for many novel K-pop fans, Eyes One came before their time, which honestly makes me feel a bit old. This is also very much applicable to me as well. Groups like 21, Girls Generation, and Shiny all came before I got into the genre, and I never really got to experience those groups at the height of their game. Everyone calls the second generation the golden age of K-pop, but I never got to experience it as a K-pop fan. I joined during the end period of the third generation. This feeling of FOMO or fear of missing out is seen everywhere in modern society. You may have never got to see Michael Jordan play basketball, or the original Star Wars came just before you. However, Eyes One is still very fresh in people's minds. This is due to when Eyes One disbanded. Eyes One had to wave goodbye to fans trapped behind screens. COVID-19 had shut the industry down. What was supposed to be a sad but gratifying event turned into quite the sorrowful scene. If you go to change.org today, you can see various petitions to keep Eyes One together. These serve as relics of the past, battle scars of the public's effort to try to keep this group together. And the community's effort to keep Eyes One a group picked up steam. At one point, there were serious rumors about a potential extension because of the public's outcry. Their fandom, Wiz One, would create an initiative called Parallel Universe as an homage to the song of the same name. The initiative was an attempt to prevent the group from disbanding and would collect an estimate of 900,000 USD. The large fundraising effort, combined with the objective success of Eyes One as a group, would lead many to hold a genuine belief of a group extension. Yet Eyes One would continue with their planned disbandment on April 29th, 2021. There is one thing I want to make clear in this section. This video is not a comprehensive overview or historical documentation of Eyes One as a group. I will be touching on some prior events surrounding this group, but I don't want people getting the wrong implication. Most people who clicked on this video probably already know who Eyes One are and have listened to their music before. And for the people who don't know, here's an incredibly fast lightning round to get you caught up. Eyes One was a 12-member girl group formed from Produce 48. The members include Jo Yuri, Choi Yena, Kang Hyewon, An Yujin, Lee Cheyun, Nako Yubuki, Hitomi Honda, Kwon Unbi, Kim Minju, Sakura Miyawaki, Kim Chaewon, and Jang Wong Young. Eyes One would last around two and a half years, have four Korean comebacks after their debut, and three Japanese comebacks along with their Japanese debut. They were managed by Off The Record, and a few of the members, including Hitomi, Nako, and Sakura, had idol experience in Japan prior to their debut in Eyes One. This is obviously a gross simplification of Eyes One, but if you were completely unaware of them heading into this, hopefully that helped at least a little. My second stipulation is that I will not be covering their Japanese releases, for a very simple reason. I don't like their Japanese releases. Personally, I am not a fan of the production or concepts behind their Japanese releases. They tend to not relate to the conceptual identity of the group like their main Korean releases did. I do not listen to them often, and I would be a poor essay content creator to cover a topic which I do not care for nor indulge in. Some K-pop stands can really learn a lesson about not speaking on topics they don't know anything about. I apologize if that disappoints any of you, I know their Japanese releases are a staple part of their discography, but again, this isn't a history video. However, before we get into what this video title implies, I do want to cover their main Korean releases and how they crafted one of the most iconic girl groups of all time. La 
Mahavian Rose thrives off of simplicity. Really, that seemed to be the goal for Eyes One's debut. Give them a track with basic hooks and a string-laced instrumental. A company wants to show off the talents of the members whilst limiting risk. Lavian Rose is what we call in football a check down, a pass that is usually last in the progression tree of a quarterback and typically is used when the other options are out of play. Screen passes are similar in which they aren't overly complicated plays but can go a long way when utilized correctly. More on the screen. What a burst! Trayvon Henderson! As advertised, touchdown Buckeyes! And that's what Lavian Rose is. It's a simple play that went a long way. Lavian Rose gives Eyes One an identity in a really smart way. See, Eyes One's identity, visually at least, is all about color and flowers. Lavian Rose is full of pastel pinks, mild reds, and deep scarlets. Quick flashes of light blues are sprinkled in to keep the visuals fresh, but the idea is very much present. This song, as the title suggests, is all about the rose. Not in a necessarily overt way, mind you, the song is still very much its own thing. I counted maybe four or five shots with actual roses in them. However, this song starts the trend in Eyes One songs of matching the concept to the color palette in an incredibly methodical way. We see this down the line with all of their Korean releases. The rose is a prominent flower in pop culture, and I found it interesting that they depicted it in an almost delicate way. Typically when I think of roses, I think of Hanami from Jujutsu Kaisen, Zyra from League of Legends, or Cynthia's Roserade, strong plants with stinging thorns. Yet the rose depicted in Lavian Rose is surrounded by softer shades of yellow and pink. The name Lavian Rose directly translates to life in pink, symbolizing life through rose-tinted glasses. Most of the sets are quite barren, with very basic set pieces like a fridge or table, the backdrops serving as a stage for the members entirely. This really is their time to shine. No hiding behind ugly CGI or elaborate set pieces, just you and a bundle of roses. I think it's executed well, the members are all styled well and they sell the concept, albeit if there is one critique I have, it's the on-screen presence, specifically the facial expressions. A few members in this music video look, well, new to being on camera, if that makes any sense. There are some awkward and intense staring and odd expressions at times. Again, they were rookies, so I'll cut them a little bit of slack, but it was one thing I noticed while combing over the MV 50 plus times. Next, I want to touch on the choreography. Eyes One's choreos are very difficult. Eyes One choreographies rely on two things, timing and formations. Eyes One sells the concept through the choreography, and heavily lean on hand movements to create elaborate formations that resemble things such as petals blowing in the wind or a giant flower. Just like the music video or song, the choreography itself is a way to express the art. While a majority of the choreo relies on intricate hand movements, this doesn't mean they aren't competent dancers in other regards. That is certainly not the case. There are more traditional choreo concepts thrown into their performances. But Eyes One choreos were always just different. Synchronization in K-pop is what makes a performance a performance, but with Eyes One choreos, everyone needed to be perfect. Every little hand movement, formation change, and dance break needed to be flawless. For a group just debuting, Lavian Rose's choreo is exemplary. In the first 10 seconds alone, we see flower-esque imagery using hand and arm movements while meticulously placing the members in a circular formation to represent the outstretched petals of a blooming flower. One minute in, during the pre-chorus, the front three members lead a movement which is promptly followed by the rest. This type of choreo gives depth to the performance. Eyes One has quite a few members, 12 to be exact, so utilizing every member in these formations is paramount. I think the most memorable piece of choreo is during the chorus, where the members use their hands to mimic the act of tossing pedals, doing it to the beat of the plucked guitar. The immediate fade into the bridge utilizes a hybrid V formation in tandem with arm movements to add a very fluid motion to the choreo. Lavian Rose's choreo feels very intricate and deliberate. There isn't wasted space, yet it isn't exhausting to watch, quite the opposite. With some groups, I get tired just watching them jump around the stage doing flips and fast movements, but with this song, the choreo really matches the relaxed vibe without feeling lazy or tacky. You may be saying, well, Teju, certainly other groups have attempted similar things. Eyes One can't be the only one performing at this level. You would be somewhat right. Eyes One certainly isn't the only group that could pull off these formation concepts. Luna immediately comes to mind before their unfortunate end. However, they had the perfect idols to do it. 
again, they had a 12-member group, affording them the space to attempt such intricate concepts, and those members were also rookies, most likely driven and ambitious enough to tackle these difficult choreos. These girls only had a finite amount of time together, and I imagine they wanted to prove all they could to their peers. That motivation paid off. This debut was a huge success. It's personally one of, if not my favorite debut of all time. It does everything you would want a debut to strive for. It gives each member ample spotlight. The line distribution certainly wasn't perfect, nor was it really ever, but each member got their screen time in this MV. The members were able to display their talents well. We will eventually touch on this subject, but each member did deserve to be in this group. Each member brought something to the table, whether it be through dance, visuals, or vocals. Eyes One on paper looks like a near-perfect girl group, with the debut to back it up. Lavian Rose is a fantastic debut because it knows exactly what it wants to be. It's not trying to perfect a concept by any means, but to introduce an overarching theme to Eyes One's future releases. Lavian Rose thrives off the dichotomy that it creates between itself and the rest of the music space at the time. It's a very simple song for today's K-pop standards. In today's climate, K-pop is going through a let's fuck around and find out stage where each group is trying to experiment with new sounds, and while I'm all for that, it can also lead to jarring music. Lavian Rose is the opposite, driven by soft drum lines and that plucked string instrument. It ends up being very light on its feet. It feels as calm as a nice spring afternoon. It's not trying to do too much, and as a result, stands out amongst other debuts. The music video follows suit with basic transitions and sets. The choreo is the difference. It combines intricacy and delicacy, finding the perfect balance. Thus, Lavian Rose becomes that painting you want to look at just a bit closer to catch all those fine details. I've gushed over this song quite a lot, but it truly is that good. One of the greatest girl group debuts in the last decade, and arguably the best produced group debut of all time. <laughs> Just a few months later, Eyes One would return with their first comeback, Hard Eyes, and subsequent lead track, Violetta. If their debut established their concept, Violetta started to tinker with it. It continues the trend of matching a specific flower to a specific color, this time being the violet, which are scarcely present in the music video. Just like how roses aren't always red, violets are not always blue. They can also be white and even yellow. In the opening shot, we see one young sitting in a field of flowers, and it's hard to tell, but I believe there are actually some white violets scattered around. The music video incorporates various tints of blues and purples, including Won Young's hair. There's also a very prominent focus on reflective materials, such as jewels or glass. This is echoed in the chorus, with wind chime-like synths that feel like beams of light darting throughout the melody. The members are adorned with shinier outfits and wear crystalline earrings. If Lavian Rose followed a more subtle, matte dynamic with its presentation, Violetta is lustrous and profound. It is a juxtaposition to the debut that I don't see many cover. Violetta is vastly different in presentation, but also incredibly similar with its concept. They almost act as two sides of the same coin. I like how the music video incorporates the previous hues we saw in La Vian Rose into some of the individual scenes, like during some of Chaewon's shots, where a lighter pink blends with a soft blue to create a violet effect, almost as if La Vian Rose and Violetta are coming together to create a bigger picture. There are still some lingering, staring shots from the previous music video, but this time around they are a little better at not directly piercing my soul. The choreo shots are more elaborate. We see them dance in an open ballroom and illuminated backdrops. There's a water dance sequence, and the only light shining in the back is a deep violet. 
There's also this one shot I'll geek over as a cinematography lover, and that's the scene where Sakura wakes up and the field of flowers present earlier in Won Young's shots are now transferred into the room full of crystal mirrors. The flowers cover the entire floor and even extend into the walls as petals fall from the ceiling. Those are all real flowers, or at least tangible objects. You can tell by the reflection of the flowers from the mirrors situated behind Sakura. If they weren't, that effect would be excruciatingly hard to pull off. Or they did actually pull it off and the CGI flowers look incredibly realistic. Nonetheless, the shot is absolutely gorgeous, and I love how the team used the mirrors to expand the flower field in the shot, giving what in reality is a small area a much larger feel. Now let's talk about formations, because yes, Eyes One got even better at formations in their first comeback. The hand movements returned from their debut, utilizing wavy motions in order to sell the lighter feel of the individual verse sections. My favorite formation is during the second chorus where Sakura leads and the members fan out into a widened V, whilst slowly spreading out and raising their arms. One thing I've noticed that Eyes One love to do in their choreos is utilize the change in elevation with their members, and having 12 helped pull it off. Occasionally, a set number of members would kneel down while performing a move, while the other set would perform the same move but standing. This similar concept is applied in other parts of the song. The members would all perform the same movements, but one set would move towards the back and the other towards the front during the pre-chorus or when the front five members would lower to the floor while performing the signature arm movement during the first chorus. The reason we don't see a lot of that in choreos from girl groups anymore is the reason girl groups just don't have enough members. Eyes One's size allowed for them to be creative with their choreographies and paint that picture that I described when talking about La Vian Rose. Moving on from the choreography, what is the actual song like? Violet it both takes cues from La Vian Rose but also experiments with the established concept. For example, throughout many of the various verse sections, a plucked synth chord can be heard following the rhythmic snaps. This reminded me of the strings that drove the chorus of La Vian Rose. Lighter string usage typically evokes more ethereal and elegant concepts. This is reinforced by how posh everything in Violetta feels. Whilst Violetta carries similar production to La Vian Rose in this way, it also incorporates new sounds during the pre-chorus and chorus sections. We see the implementation of bouncier chords, snare buildups, horns, and even EDM elements. In a way, this makes the track feel more aggressive and bold compared to La Vian Rose. This all culminates in arguably one of the most satisfying bridge sequences in Eyes One's discography. <laughs> During each chorus, slightly after the beat is removed, a member will say and the instrumental abruptly explodes. I really love the juxtaposition in this moment, kind of like the gemstones we see in the video. Diamonds may look shiny and pretty, harmless even, but many forget their durability and toughness. I think these themes are echoed throughout the production of the songs, but even the music video itself. During the final chorus, Jo Yuri is just continuously belting in the background. She both caps off the build-up with a high note, but then further drives the chorus with her ad-libs. The final chorus also features a breakdown not present in the others, which further amplifies the EDM synths. All of this together makes Violetta both relate but also stand out compared to their debut, serving as proof that Stone Music was willing to immediately add on to the concept presented in La Vian Rose. I always feel as if, out of all the Korean comebacks Eyes One had, that Violetta never really got the credit it deserved. It served as a bridge between their huge debut and arguably their most well-known comeback fiesta. Whenever I hear people talk about their favorite Eyes One tracks, I almost never hear Violetta brought up as one of the pillars for Eyes One, which is a shame because I think it contributed a large amount to their conceptual consistency, whilst also feeling unique in its own way. 
Now, that is mainly a personal observation. There are probably millions of people out there who love this song and have it in their top three. While I didn't touch on their debut project as a whole, I do want to specifically bring up one B-side from this comeback, being one of their most popular. Hello. I'm gonna say this now, Highlight is a gem in Eyes One's discography. I will not lie to you, I'm not a huge fan of Eyes One's B-sides. A lot of them, to me, do not reflect the quality we see in their lead tracks. This does not mean there aren't great songs scattered throughout, Highlight being an example, but Highlight serves as the cherry on top of the Violetta Sunday. In a way, Highlight is a natural step forward in Eyes One's concept, a chic reimagining of Violetta itself. Highlight is glossy, elegant, and luxurious. During their promotions for this song, including their performances at the MGMA and KCON New York, they wore darker blue and black outfits. Everything about this song feels like it's showing off, but in reality, the lyrics are the opposite, speaking on self-love and emboldening the recipients to be their natural self that their actions are the speaker's sunlight. A call to be confident in yourself, just like how the speaker makes their own highlight. It's a powerful message expressed through the choreography itself. Instead of the intricate chorus sequences like in past Eyes One works, here the members simply throw their arms up and just sway to the beat. It's in complete juxtaposition to their previous sequences. Typically, the Eyes One choreos we see have complex formations and hand movements, but here the members are simply allowing themselves to be the highlight, the focal point. The production follows in these footsteps. The course itself is reminiscent of something you would hear in a fashion advert or a runway show, low thumping beats and flickering synths. It's quite simple compared to Violetta. Highlight is somewhat of a preview of what would come, primarily in the production and presentation. Highlight is confident, no doubt about that, but it's the absence of brazen cockiness that's shocking. Remember, this is a group that had debuted mere months before this release, and they were already establishing a mystifying presence within the scene. And to release a song that is literally telling the audience, hey, look at me, don't take your eyes off what I'm doing, it's this confidence that we will see follow in their next release. There are various production elements that we will see translate to future releases, most notably the trumpets we hear during the final chorus. I wanted to specifically mention Highlight because, to me, it is one of their best b-sides, and an inflection point early in their career. A point we can look back on and say, this is where the group really came together and solidified. I remember for a long time, I actually thought this was a cover song. The production was so solid and the concept so bold. No way a rookie girl group a few months old would make a song like this. It had to be some sort of recreation or cover, right? This obviously wasn't the case. What would follow Violetta and Highlight would arguably be their most well-known comeback and a personal favorite of mine, a release that would propel Eyes One up the ladder of girl groups and into produce group infamy. Out of all of the Eyes One comebacks, this was the one I was the most intimidated to discuss. There is just so much going on, from the instrumental to the music video, the styling, and the choreo. The whole package feels like one big fever dream compared to Lavion Rose and Violetta. The previous two comebacks focused on tying a specific color palette to a flower. In Lavion Rose, it was a rose, and in Violetta, it was a violet. This time around, in Fiesta, I believe the flower is supposed to be Eyes One themselves. There isn't one true color dynamic that is featured in this video. There are deep cyans, blacks and whites, burnt orange and bright yellows, scarlets and lighter pinks. The expanded color selection leads to an influx of creative set design compared to their previous videos. Performing in grandiose throne rooms, enclosed by a tunnel of glasses, and on a beach, I'm not quite sure what this set is. The cinematography plays around with changes in the aspect ratio, like during Joe Yuri's pre-chorus and the lead into the final bridge. Changing an aspect ratio can give a video an instant tone shift. When the ratio becomes slimmer during a bridge section, it can add some cinematic tension to a shot. 
You've probably noticed this while watching this video. I've been specifically using a slimmer aspect ratio in an attempt to resonate more emotion to the viewer. Transitions are also a focal point in this music video. There are some gorgeous transitions, specifically in the verse sections. 30 seconds in, and we have a shot of Heiwan seemingly off-camera holding up a yellow ball, mirroring the circular aspect ratio merely seconds prior, which then leads to a framing transition of Minju looking up from a circular mirror whilst her dress is spread out in a circle. I just mentioned four circular motifs within one simple transition, not even taking into account the people holding up the larger versions of that same circular mirror around her. Using a simple shape to frame an entire transition sequence that lasts only about four seconds shows the dedication and passion that must have gone into the execution of this music video. Around 40 seconds in, we see that the room Hitomi sits in actually leads to the room that Nako is in in her individual b-roll scenes. There are large polished black doors that open behind Hitomi, which leads into Nako's shot with those same doors opening. This is a very subtle yet very effective way of world building. Where are these characters that we're seeing in this music video? There's also another shot that I recall later in the music video where Yujin's dress ends up serving as these sort of curtains that lead into Heiwan's shot. We can even see Heiwan's shadow on Yujin's dress. In a way, it feels almost liminal because of how these shots loop into one another. After Nako's shot, we are gifted arguably the most pulchritudinous... Wait, what the... The fuck does pulchritudinous mean? Oh, okay, apparently while I was writing this script, I searched up synonyms for beautiful on Google and picked the hardest one to say just to piss off future me whenever I had to read it. I don't even know what to say to that. That's just petty as fuck. Anyway, this shot is magnificent purely because of the framing and formation. The confetti shoots out from the sides on the drop, the arm movements mirroring the base, the slight strobing light that bounces off the falling confetti. It gives this scene a sort of life that isn't felt elsewhere, and the patterns on the outfits meshing with the patterns on the walls behind them adds this cohesiveness between the set and the styling. There's a shot briefly after the chorus ends where the camera zooms in on Minju and she does this little wink in sync with the chime. And for whatever reason, that has been an iconic music video moment for me ever since I watched this for the first time. Whenever I listen to Fiesta and hear that little chime in the beat, I always remember her like little wink to the camera. <laughs> One minute and 42 seconds in, the greatest transition in K-pop music video history happens. And no, that is definitely not an over-exaggeration on my part. The short sequence where on beat, one young telegraphs an arm movement as a circle is drawn around her. That same circle then becomes a spotlight shown in Minju's B-roll scene, and you can see the shadow of one young within that spotlight. <laughs> I can't do that scene justice, you're just gonna have to watch it for yourself. It's the fastest transition and to some is such an afterthought, but it's so technically impressive, even if it is really just a simple match cut, but the framing makes it so unique. And I sat down and tried to write about this last chorus sequence for like five minutes and I just could not like emphasize everything going on, so I'm just gonna let you watch. <laughs> But, okay, let me interject. The way the aspect ratio tightens back as they switch into those black and white outfits as the post-course hits is just the cherry on top. It adds this non-stop tension to the song that carries till its final breath. But that's enough with this gorgeous music video. Let's move on to the song. The song itself sort of feels like the perfect Eyes One song. What I mean by that is this song is everything they were building to with their first two comebacks. The horns that I mentioned in Highlight, specifically during the chorus, make a reappearance here, altered in various ways throughout the chorus, but the same sort of dynamic. The synths remind me of the ones used in God 7s Lullaby, these ethereal, almost dreamlike chords. In fact, the more I listened to these two songs, the more I thought they sounded like distant relatives. Seriously, give these two sections a listen and tell me I'm not going crazy here. <laughs> Yeah. 
They have nearly identical openings. Felt like I had a light bulb moment when I was like, where have I heard this synth before? I was like, oh shit, GOT7. There are ingredients laced through this instrumental that we've seen before. A steady snare buildup in the pre-chorus, those introductory snap counts during the opening section, the horns in the back half of that chorus. These are all things that we've heard before in previous Eyes 1 songs, but it feels like it all comes together here. This feels like Eyes 1's final project, yet we still have two more mainline Korean comebacks to go. I remember when this song first dropped, I saw a good amount of pushback by some less than enthused netizens shouting that the course was too convoluted, the production was messy, and the song sounded directionless. At first, I actually agreed. I vividly recall not enjoying this song the first few listens, but as the years rolled by and I consumed it more, I ended up digging deeper into the production and liking it a lot more. It eventually became one of my favorite K-pop songs of all time if you've watched my top 25 K-pop song list. I think some of the pushback was because while Eyes One tried to warm everyone up to louder EDM sounds with Violetta, this song is obnoxiously loud with its horn usage at times. Like if you randomly skip to the chorus on accident, you may get a right hook to the ear canal from this production. It's abrasive and aggressive compared to previous tracks from them. But more than loud, it's confident, oozing this sort of radiance. On highlight, they exuded this chic confidence, robust but very quiet. Fiesta is loud about its confidence, and I feel like it translates into the choreography. The choreo for Fiesta carries over similar tendencies we have already covered in their past releases. There is the flower formation during the previously mentioned pre-chorus section, but a lot of the chorus is fast and rigid. Pulsating jabs follow the flow of the lyrics. It relies more on powerful yet elegant movements to match the musical persona. It is incredibly up-tempo compared to some of their previous tracks like La Vie en Rose. This all culminates in Eyes One's best post-chorus section during the final stretch of the song. This is where every aspect of Eyes One doesn't just shine, but it evolves. After the final main chorus section, the aspect ratio tightens to a darkened room with a spotlight. The girls are wearing black and white outfits. There's a shot of Chewan leading all the movements as the confetti falls around her. The ad-libs, the change in elevation with the other members matching Chewan's movements. What we have discussed from La Vie en Rose till now, all those fine details through the song production, styling, choreography, and cinematography all culminate in this final section. This is what Eyes One is as a group. They are every color, every feeling reflecting off the fluttering flower petals that fall in early spring. They are the subtle pinks and purples that outline a setting sun, the deep beiges and grays that frame a studio, the bright blues and vibrant greens that paint the meadows on a summer's day. Eyes One's music feels like I stepped outside and took a long, deep breath as the last frost melts. While Fiesta feels like a departure from their color and flower concept, it's actually the perfected version of it. I believe Fiesta was the true turning point in Eyes One's career. They weren't just a new girl group with some talent and decent music, they were competing with the likes of the holy trinity of the third generation. So where do you go when you essentially perfect your concept on your third try? Well, you abandon it, of course. The term abandon might be a little strong here. They certainly lost one piece of the puzzle, that being the flower aspect to their concept. Secret Story of the Swan does not touch on any flower motifs, nor does it emphasize a certain flower or even color relating to a flower. Instead, it morphs its color concept to allow the palette to develop and expand. Gone are the soft beige, reds, and yellows. Secret Story of the Swan is filled with bright whites, hardened silver and golds, dreamlike pinks and purples. There's a newfound richness to the color palette, a change that is a direct result of the group's growing confidence. I've touched on Eyes One's confidence in previous entries with Highlight and Fiesta, however, it feels as if the dial is once again turned up another notch. Remember those horns that accompanied the chorus of Fiesta and the back half of Highlight? The ones that may or may not have blown out an unsuspecting eardrum? Those are back. Oh, they are so back. 
louder than ever. Secret Story of the Swan's course makes fiestas at times look quiet in comparison. This is all done very deliberately. Notice how, in tandem with the group's growing confidence, the range and color palette changes as well. Until this point, it has been a subtle yet direct shift. La Bien Rose was straightforward and somewhat docile. Violetta introduced EDM elements alongside luxurious outfits and materials. Fiesta added horns, loud dance sections, and expanded the hue dynamic to fit all sorts of tones and textures. As the group matures along its path, the music itself is changing alongside them, growing more complex as time moves forward. Secret Story of the Swan then becomes an accumulation of this. It's tumultuous because it's trying to be. We see posh elements return, the members wearing gold dresses and dazzling earrings. Unbi is even wearing a crown, or it may be a tiara, I can't quite tell if it completes the circle. This MV shares some similarities to previous videos. We get a water dance sequence during the dance break just like in Violetta, angular yet simple set designs return from Fiesta. The new and quite obvious change from the previous few videos is the heavy reliance on CGI sets. CGI had been used in small quantities in their previous music videos, more so in Fiesta. Secret Story of the Swan differs in that entire sets are adorned in CGI backdrops with a heavy dose of green screen. I'm not saying it looks bad, in fact some of the CGI work looks quite good at times. However, there are two issues that I have with this approach. It's obvious they went with this path because of the concept of Secret Story of the Swan. It relays the message of becoming who you want to be, and Eyes One seem to portray themselves as the protagonists of some sort of fairy tale. Thus, the music video has to be otherworldly, fictional in a sense. This is why a good majority of the MV is in a flying car, soaring into the clouds above. My first issue is that because they are trying to portray this fantasy world, they lose the sense of realism their previous music videos had. I hear you say, isn't that the point of making a fantasy world, to lose the realistic aspects of the already existing world? You would be right on the money with that assessment, except that doesn't work for a K-pop music video. See, drawing in your audience with CGI doesn't create a fantasy world, it only removes the viewer from the experience, detaching us with odd lighting dynamics and weird cuts. My old group's Dreamcatcher, they tried to recently do this with their Apocalypse series with the releases Maison and Vision. Two music videos heavily reliant on CGI, in fact Maison's music video is basically all in CGI. This is cool in a technical sense, but in a K-pop music video it looks disjointed, especially during the choreo shots where the lighting just looks all sorts of off. While I'm quite impressed with some of the CGI work in these music videos and Vision does rely a lot more on practical sets, Maison looks ugly in a lot of shots. It ends up actually detaching me as a viewer more than immersing me in some sort of fantasy world they're creating. Maison's music video to me looks more like a rip-off Devil May Cry arena or a Darksider set rather than an actual K-pop music video. Sometimes when you try to green screen real human beings into fake cutout worlds, it just doesn't quite look right. And that's just what happens here. My second issue is that the music video is just boring compared to Fiesta. There isn't a whole lot here that intrigues me. So there's something going on with clocks, why are they floating in boats, is that related to the swan motif, and if so, how does that connect to the larger picture of finding your true self? There's a flying car, and I assume all these elements do connect together in some sort of thematic sense, but it doesn't do it in a way that makes me want to dig into the music video and find out the true meaning behind these scenes. I had so many questions after around the first 40 seconds of the music video, and I had even more coming out. This music video feels like it knows where it wants to go, but instead of listening to Google Maps, it takes a back road because it quote-unquote knows where to go and ends up getting lost. In the end, it's a fine K-pop music video, but very bland for Eyes One, and this is the group that essentially danced in front of Baron Rooms for their debut. The only thing that really saves it for me is the expanded color dynamic. The sharp yellows, deep pinks, and glowing whites are a newcomer to Eyes One's color stockpile and a welcome addition here. Very pleasing to the eye, and it does save a lot of these shots. To sum up my gripes, instead of getting lost in the world like the MV wants me to, because of the very shallow world building, I end up getting lost with the world. 
Moving on to the actual music itself, Secret Story of the Swan feels very odd compared to previous tracks. First, the title is way longer than any other Korean title track thus far. The composition is quite similar, subtle synth-driven verse sections, scaling snare buildups, and a loud horn chorus. After Fiesta and Secret Story of the Swan, you can start to see a pattern. Even on the drop, just like in Lavian Rose and Violetta, there's a very brief pause with the drop, where a member interjects and says a line. Here it's with elegance. But it's because the song relies so heavily on this horn that it loses a bit of its luster. It's not a bad song by any means, but it is my least favorite Eyes One Korean title track. The chorus is very one note, and while I enjoy the powerful choreography which we will get to, the song itself ends up a bit flat, even with the obnoxiously loud horns. The real saving grace here is that immaculate bridge and well-placed dance break. Dance breaks are best served after vocally driven bridges, and Aizwen has shown to be quite proficient with them. The bridge is once again led by the main vocalist, Joe Yuri, who sets us adrift with a beautiful falsetto followed with a high note which carries us into the dance break led by Lee Cheon. Eyes One was smart in the way that they let their main vocalist sing and let their main dancer dance. Some K-pop groups love to try to fit square pegs into circle holes. Eyes One let their vocalist, like Jo Yuri, sing on a bridge because they knew that she had the vocals to back it up. They let Lee Cheon lead a dance break because she was the main dancer. The bridge into the dance break into the final chorus is the only moment in the song that really hooks me, sells me on its intensity. I just wish the whole song clicked for me like that, but the rest feels like as if it's chasing the end. The choreo is powerful and sharp, while mimicking the lyrics and being elegant with arm movements at the beginning and during the chorus symbolizing the wing of a swan. I hope me reviewing some of these comebacks has shown you that Eyes One is really fucking good at dancing. Like. Their formations are some of the most precise ever, and members met the mark every time. I love the choreo for this song. It's demanding when it needs to be, it utilizes all the previous motifs we have touched on, the hand movements, the elevation changes, the V formations, and repetition. The way the step count picks up on the second beat drop within the chorus, Hitomi mirroring Yujin's movements coming out of the rap section, that little sidestep move they do in the pre-chorus, and heels, no less. Just this whole dance break. I always had a high respect for Eyes One's choreos and their dancing ability when they were a group, but after combing through their music videos like 50 times over, seeing all their performances, watching the dance practices, I have an even higher level of respect for their dancing ability. They are seriously some of the most underrated dancers in recent K-pop memory. The message of the song speaks to dancing with elegance like a swan, and to that, Eyes One delivers. According to Birdzilla, yes, Birdzilla, that's a sick-ass website name, by the way, Quote, however, seeing a swan may also serve as a call for silence or a reminder to embrace grace and elegance in your demeanor. Additionally, it can be a lesson or message about self-awareness and acceptance of your inner beauty, reminding you to recognize and embrace your true power and uniqueness. In Secret Story of the Swan, Eyes One represents more than just a simple color or flower. They communicate the will to find your inner self, reveal your true desires and goals, and thrust them out for the world to see with confidence. This is in part why the choreo and even the song itself aren't traditionally elegant as many would perceive elegance. When I think of elegance, the last thing I think of is a blaring horn. Secret Story of the Swan's message goes beyond thematics. It's a real message to the rest of K-pop. Eyes One aren't your average girl group. They won't settle for overdone cute concepts or stale girl crush sounds. Eyes One will create their own path, one forged with determination, effort, and execution. Secret Story of the Swan is a proclamation of power, a desire to become a legendary girl group. And I think it may have just worked.
Panorama would ultimately serve as Eyes One's final comeback, releasing alongside One Reeler Act 4 on December 7th, 2020. The further we stray away from this release, the more it feels less like a conclusion to Eyes One's legacy, and more like a comeback that would fit right in the middle of their discography. When this released at the time, I had fallen out with Eyes One's music, not because I didn't like it, it was more because I was discovering other groups and had kind of forgotten about Eyes One. I enjoyed Panorama on its release and still do today, however, after analyzing all of their Korean releases, I don't like Panorama nearly as much as I used to. In their previous comeback, they had somewhat abandoned their flower concept in favor of embracing an expansive set of colors. This carries over into Panorama. Panorama reminds me of what Violetta would look like, the outfits, the sets. If it weren't restricted to exclusively wrap its concept around the violet flowers and colors associated with those. Panorama is quite posh, judging strictly from the styling alone. I particularly like Quan Unbi's short blonde bob and Sakura's pink hair. There's one specific choreo shot in a room adorned in gold, white, black, and silver accents. Kind of summarizes all of the different luxurious aspects of this music video. Not that a comeback like Violetta wasn't, but Panorama really is just Eyes One's color concept, but make it rich. Really, there are too many colors for me to even count. Wenyoung's B-roll scene grabbed my attention because it uses incredibly similar hues as their previous comeback, Secret Story of the Swan, did. Like, if you literally tear that shot out of Panorama and put it in Secret Story of the Swan, I would have never been able to guess that it wasn't from Secret Story of the Swan. There's another choreo shot inside a slightly enclosed pillar-esque structure in a lighter tone, which allows the members' black outfits to stand out nicely. It's also another simple polygon set, similar to the ones we've seen in Fiesta and Secret Story of the Swan. I know it's odd to refer to some of these sets as simple polygon sets, but that's quite literally what they are. Basic structures created out of basic shapes. The example here is quite bare bones compared to the others, but the ones in Fiesta and Secret Story of the Swan use similar approaches. I imagine this was done in order to allow the members to stand out amongst the background without making the MV feel too plain. It gives the viewer something to look at while not being overloaded with objects or on-screen effects. This MV finally made me realize Eyes One's music videos don't really have an interconnected plot or even internalized story. Do they all share concepts? Most definitely, but all of their Korean title tracks are essentially simple yet effective sets, individual B-roll with objects to match an aesthetic, and really nothing more than that. There are some pretty simple thematics throughout Secret Story of the Swan and Panorama, and some shots intertwine with one another, but there is not a real story to be found here. Maybe the team behind the MVs didn't want to create a drawn-out story as Eyes One was a temporary group. I could speculate, but the decision was made. It doesn't make the MVs feel any more forgettable than an MV with a story. It was just an observation I wanted to point out. Again, I've been blabbering for like 40 minutes about these music videos, so trust me when I say I still like them, even if they don't have some like really intense story behind them. There's also sort of this kaleidoscope theme with some of the individual shots. Really feels like filler here to keep the MV going, but it's something they hadn't used previously, and I couldn't tell you why they just randomly started using it here. You figure they'd also use this in like Violetta as well. I guess some kaleidoscopes can be viewed similar to a lens, so maybe that's why they used it here, and the entire theme of this music video is cameras and lenses. Now that I say that out loud, that's probably the reason why it's in the music video. Um... You know, I have this script, but I just think of stuff, like, halfway through. I'll be like, oh, shit, that's why that's there. You know? Sometimes when you write a script, you don't find it all out. I'm just, I'm just going where the wind takes me here. My favorite shot in the whole music video is this one very brief section of Sakura's B-roll, where she has pink and yellow curtains, the pink matching both her hair color and the dress she's wearing, and typically that would be too much pink. Sometimes if you use too much of one color, it makes a shot really overbearing. I complained a little bit about this when talking about Espa's Savage music video and their comeback ranking. There's one shot where, ironically enough, there's just a shit ton of pink and it's not balanced out well at all. But here, Sakura is intentionally framed to be standing in front of the yellow, which ends up balancing out the whole shot and it actually looks really pretty. Also, I feel like there's going to be some keyboard warriors after me saying that. That's not a dig on Espa. I love Espa. It's just an example of previously observed phenomenon in K-pop music videos in the past. Please do not go at me in the comments about that. The clear motif throughout the entire video is the camera, utilizing various composition styles and different Polaroids. At one point, Hitomi even hides behind strips of film. Panorama signifies Eyes One capturing their time as a group, internalizing their legacy as a group. 
the instrumentation establishes Eyes One's pattern. We see the return of shallow horns, delayed drops, and bouncy synthetic melodies. Added is this sleek violin, which can notably be heard leading into Yena's section. The horns here are much quieter compared to Fiesta and Secret Story of the Swan, and they're also much less brassy than the horns used in the previous two. They end up taking more of a backseat to the dance-heavy bass, which I really like because three straight Eyes One songs with overpowering horns would have been a little too much for me. Fiesta's horn is much lighter to the point where I'm pretty sure you can consider it more of a trumpet than a traditional horn. A lot of different websites say they're squeakier horns. They could be, but they sound more like trumpets to me. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Anyway, back on topic. I really like how this song utilizes a proper two-part chorus, the first part being strung forward by vocals and the second showcasing the instrumentation while adding an additional synth. They repeat the delayed drop with the signature panorama in the middle of the chorus leading into the second section to allow the chorus to feel full and not as choppy. I also quite like how the final chorus is slightly pitched up in key to match Won Young's super high vocal tone. About 3 minutes and 23 seconds into the song, there's this moment where the synth inflection we've heard throughout the song builds and is cut off to match the exact moment Yena does this move in the choreo to match the members. There's nothing really extraordinary there, it's just a really satisfying moment. <laughs> Panorama as a song is quite good. I would say it's my fourth favorite Eyes One Korean title track. If you said that to me about two years ago, I would have laughed at you. I vividly remember being obsessed with this song for a while, being my favorite Eyes One song for close to a year. Not sure what I loved so much about this song, because it really had nothing to do with the emotional momentum this song brought with it. I admit the production is great here, the vocal performances match the delivery of every other Eyes One comeback, the choreo while I touched on less here is still exemplary. Couldn't tell you why I loved it so much, I just did. I think it just became overplayed for me as time went on and I grew more sour towards it, but sour is a strong term, I still really like this song. More interestingly, Panorama did exactly what it was supposed to do. Think of Panorama as a frame hanging on a wall, a family portrait per se. Panorama figuratively within the context of its lyrics, but also literally served as Eyes One permanently stamping their place in K-pop history. Eyes One would go on to become one of the most beloved girl groups ever. Fans still converse about Eyes One now as they did back in 2020. I'm making an over hour long video about them. Honestly, the sad part is, is that Eyes One couldn't even properly perform this song in front of people. Panorama was released during the height of COVID-19. When they performed this song at the big year-end award shows, the MAMAs, the MMAs, there wasn't a single fan in attendance. Panorama and its release is similar to the high schoolers who graduated during the pandemic. I happen to be someone who experienced my final two years of high school during the pandemic. My final year of high school felt underwhelming to say the least. It's supposed to be this really big celebration, a last hurrah before you were thrusted into the real world, but my final year felt like a dream that only lasted about 30 minutes. To me, that's what Panorama feels like. This is supposed to be Eyes One's last major comeback. A group that had gained so much attention and respect from the K-pop community is supposed to go out like a brilliant firework, but Panorama feels more like a sparkler. It's not a bad comeback by any means, but this is the disbandment comeback we get from the most iconic produced group of all time. It almost feels as if Off The Record themselves planned for a longer stint with Eyes One and had to settle for Panorama being a shoe in final comeback. There's no way that could have possibly happened. They had a set contract length. They knew exactly when Eyes One was going to disband. So why didn't they get a more lustrous comeback? I might be the only one who has that feeling, but it felt as if Eyes One was destined for more. Panorama feels like an odd conclusion to their series of releases. It still holds on to the color concept. Panorama specifically plays with black, white, silver, and gold themes with more robust color choices, but Panorama feels distinctly separate from the rest of their comebacks. Lavian Rose, Violetta, Fiesta all felt confined in the same conceptual universe, while Secret Story of the Swan and Panorama felt like Off the Record was attempting to experiment with the color concept without relying on their previous flower motif. Secret Story of the Swan and Panorama have clear branching thematics, ones that take the focus away from their primary concept. It's hard to keep a concept going on for five or more comebacks. You either run out of creative direction or you just get tired of it and follow trends. I'm happy Eyes One never caved into following a trend. Their music always felt very distinctly Eyes One, but I'm disappointed that they decided to stray away from the flower and color themes after Fiesta. 
It makes sense because Fiesta is supposed to represent the members in full bloom, essentially, but I kind of wish we would have gotten something after that would have maybe covered the rest of the life cycle of flowers. I don't know, I just felt like straying away from that concept was definitely more of a negative than a positive. Post-Fiesta releases just felt like they lost a little bit of that Eyes One charm that made the group so identifiable. I think a huge reason as to why fans felt so dejected about Eyes One's disbandment was because their discography didn't feel finished yet. It still felt as if it had just scraped the surface of their sound. Ultimately, Panorama serves its purpose. It's a comeback that figuratively cements Eyes One in girl group history, yet Panorama feels like the end of a story that should have never been finished. According to Merriam-Webster, impermanence is, quote, the quality or state of being impermanent. So what does impermanent mean? Impermanent can be defined as being transient or quite literally not permanent, temporary. We encounter impermanence in our everyday lives. The battery life left in your phone is not permanent. The gas in your car is not permanent. Even large trials in our lives aren't permanent. High school, college, maintaining a job, this YouTube channel, they will all eventually fade away over time. Impermanence is a key aspect of many teachings and religions. Take Buddhism, for example. Norman Fisher explains this thoroughly in his article, Impermanence is Buddha Nature, where he goes on to say, quote, As far as classical Buddhism is concerned, impermanence is the number one inescapable and essentially painful fact of life. The dread of passing on is in part a symptom of impermanence. With all this in mind, is impermanence inherently a negative thing? I would argue against that notion. I'm glad I got through primary schooling. If I were stuck in high school my whole life, I might just cry. If my phone battery never ran out, I may be glued to that screen even more than I already am. Impermanence exists to keep us from staying both figuratively and literally in the same place. Humans are constantly technologically evolving. Impermanence is a huge factor in that. We can't keep pumping greenhouse gases into the air forever, or as a species, we will literally be spelling our own doom. Thus, we have resorted to inventing new technology to combat this issue. Whether it be solar panels channeling the sun's rays, wind turbines harnessing the power of Earth's atmosphere, geothermal energy, bioenergy, hydropower, for years we have attempted to capture the power of the ocean's waves to create usable electricity. As a species, we have all done this in just the past few decades to combat an impermanent problem, as a result pushing our technology far ahead of what it would have been if we simply relied on fossil fuels forever. I know morally this is quite deep for a K-pop video, but if it wasn't for impermanence, we quite literally wouldn't be where we are as a species. Impermanence is also something I touched on in my video covering New Jean's Ditto, specifically touching on how malleable and fickle memories can be, and why relying on your past to channel current happiness can never truly push you forward. Impermanence is bound to impact anyone. It's in part why growing up can be so scary for some. This certainly was the case for me. I didn't want to grow up because my childhood brung me vast happiness. Some of my most dearest memories come from my early schooling years, before I had to worry about getting a job, driving a car, planning for my future. I would go sledding with my friends, eat Taco Bell, and then play 2K. I had literally no worries in the world. But in the long run, I'm happy life forced me to break out of my shell, working multiple jobs, becoming an engineering student. These are some of the most fulfilling moments of my life. When I found out I passed Calculus 3 this semester, I literally cried tears of joy. In relation to K-pop, the whole industry runs off of impermanence. It's why groups are only signed to seven-year contracts. Groups release new music to provide content to their fans. Imagine if a group dropped a hit song and only created that song. K-pop would become incredibly repetitive and boring. Oh, wait.
Momoland's downfall can be attributed to many things, but them trying to essentially remake Boom Boom with Bam killed any sort of momentum that group had, because it was nearly the same song. As much as some stands hate change in relation to their favorite groups, change is what ultimately drives the industry. Trends emerge and die out, but experimentation has always been a key factor in K-pop's emerging global dominance. Many fans, including myself, were attracted to K-pop because of how different it was from the West. Music shows, filling albums with collectible content, releases every five to six months, variety show content, this was all stuff that was very different from the Western pop scene and was a key part in drawing me in as a fan and is what keeps me being a fan. Ive's recent comeback, Ive Mine, received mixed reviews by netizens, specifically in regards to Batty. It was too different from their normal releases. The Girl Crush concept had been overdone over the past few years, and I weren't adding anything new to the mix here. I think some of the complaints were justified, but many would go on to say things like, why can't we just get a love dive every time, or bring back Eleven and After Like. Those are all great songs in their own right, and I understand why those netizens wanted the love dive sound back. Ive are really good at the posh, luxurious, rich aesthetic. I Am was a smash hit in part because it was such an Ive song. But if we stay in this opulent conceptual bubble with Ive, there will be no growth in their artistry. Even more netizens will complain that Ive is settling for normality. With K-pop stands, you can never please everyone, but Ive experimenting, embracing impermanence is in part why I loved their recent comeback. Allowing the artist to experiment early in their career will pay dividends later when they can expand those soundscapes. As a result, they will create complex, well-formed discographies. Some of the most successful groups in K-pop right now, Espa, New Jeans, Le Seraphim, TXT, and ATs, all make music that goes against what is typically seen as normal in K-pop. They don't stay in the box all the time. Espa's unique hyperpop sound is what attracts so many listeners, TXT popularizing emo indie rock, New Jeans taking inspiration from R&B and creating easy to listen to yet fulfilling music. These groups stand in opposition of staying in one place, constantly experimenting and finding new sounds. Even New Jeans, a group that have been criticized by many, including me, for staying within their bubble too much, have songs like Ditto and Cool With You which sound distinctly different than the attentions in OMGs. Groups like Espa, Red Velvet, Billy, Le Seraphim, and now Ive don't settle for less with their music. They constantly experiment and branch out. They embrace impermanence when it comes to their concept and sound, and thus they have attracted large fan bases. This was quite a long section talking about what impermanence is, but it's important to detail how it impacts not just K-pop, but our daily lives. How the industry essentially relies on it to keep K-pop moving ahead. Let's move on to why impermanence is so important to why Eyes One is so beloved, and how it shapes our view on temporary groups entirely. Why exactly did I make you sit through an hour of Eyes One's comebacks, and the explanation of what impermanence was? When I first thought of making a detailed breakdown of Eyes One, my first idea was not to talk about the group being temporary. Instead, I was planning on breaking down their concept and using that to display their further influence in the fourth and fifth generation. That motive was not entirely lost, but instead, as I was analyzing their comebacks, I began to speculate as to why Eyes One's concept primarily revolved around the flower. Out of all the concepts they could have gone for, why were flowers used so prominently in the lyricism and imagery of the promotional material and the music videos? Then I started to think about the life cycle of a flower. Was Eiswin's concept deliberately picked because they were metaphorically meant to represent the cycle of a flower? Their debut symbolizing the roots, Violetta expanding the stem upwards towards the sun, and Fiesta being Eiswin in full bloom. That's when everything started to really click for me. La Vie en Rose, their debut, set in stone the figurative roots of their music. The delayed drop with the signature phrase, the elegant choreo, the elevated final chorus, repetitive synth chords. These features are present through most of, if not all, Korean Eyes One title tracks. The roots of Eyes One's sound was founded in La Vie en Rose. Violetta expanded with new elements, squeakier horns and EDM soundscapes powerful choreo elements, these added on to the already present roots, just like the stem of a flower. Fiesta, which was an explosion of color, ended up being an amalgamation of the previous two comebacks. Fiesta ended up being Eyes One's main showpiece. Fiesta is what I believe to be the peak 
peak of Eyes One, the the top of the mountain, the gold medal of their discography. Fiesta is Eyes One in full bloom, which is why the accompanying album is called Bloom Eyes, and why it's also a full-length album, the complete flower of Eyes One's discography. So where does that leave Secret Story of the Swan and Panorama, the two comebacks that seemingly abandon their flower concept, songs that discuss self-discovery and cementing a legacy, where does that fit into Eyes One's flower concept? At first, I was genuinely puzzled. Why are these songs even here? Why abandon a concept right when you got good at executing it? Then I started to ponder Secret Story of the Swan's relevance in a purely figurative way. Secret Story of the Swan talks about imagining a moment lasting forever, creating a fantasy where one lives their dream for eternity. So what if we rework our view of flowers and think about them as moments in our lives, happier times per se? Secret Story of the Swan is talking about those little flowers in life, moments that you wish could remain permanent. Maybe it's something as simple as your birthday, a date, or just a general experience. Secret Story of the Swan is about the flowers we wish would remain in bloom forever, but as time passes, those flowers must wither away. Time must flow and we must grow. This comes to a conclusion with Panorama. Memories can be captured through cameras, but one will never be able to truly live and experience anything through a lens. The line that expresses this is, quote, wondering if it's a dream, don't let it stop, close your eyes and feel this moment. A common theme that I notice whenever I go to K-pop concerts is that a lot of the attendees are recording with their phones, like all the time. I'm not someone who is immune to this either. I have recorded a ton of songs from concerts that I've been to. I've been to easily over a dozen K-pop concerts, but this is a large theme that I see. People recording at times the entire concert. They want to take a fan cam of their favorite idol to post on a YouTube channel. They want to capture this moment to rewatch it later when they get home. People have their reasons, and I don't want to sound like I'm shaming anyone for those reasons. I do it too, so I would be a hypocrite by, you know, calling out these people and saying that they are not living life, right? But one concert I went to that I genuinely did not use my phone to record all that much was the P1 Harmony concert I went to all the way back in February. And coincidentally, the concert I have the most memories of that I can think back to in a moment and remember exactly what happened is the P1 Harmony concert, the concert that I didn't use my phone. Not only was that concert fantastic, but I also met some really nice individuals and ended up having a really fun time experiencing the concert with them. So when the song conveys shooting a panorama, it's not saying take a picture and frame it, it's telling the audience to live. Immerse yourself in the experience, you can't live if you won't move forward. Ironically enough, while the imagery in panorama displays different cameras and compositions and film, Panorama wants you to enjoy Eyes One while they still lasted. Did Panorama succeed in its theme of framing Eyes One as one of the greatest girl groups of all time? Yes, but I realized over time, I don't think that's what the song is really trying to say. Eyes One was never meant to be permanent. They were a produced group that had a finite amount of time, and that's why their concept was the flower and, in extension, colors. Our lives are defined by vast colors and experiences. Eyes One's concept communicates the cycle of the flower and the impermanence of these experiences. An impermanence that should be welcomed rather than feared. Eyes One as a group could reflect a better time for some. When Eyes One promoted, I was still really getting into K-pop and their music helped expand my intrigue into the genre. There was an incredibly positive vibe surrounding the group, and thus, when we reflect on them, doesn't the thought of the group kind of sting a little? That kind of sensation that just hits you in the chest and weighs you down, a sense of sad nostalgia. I hold Eyes One in very high regard, not just because of my love for their music and when they were promoted, but even now, reflecting back on them as a group. After taking a deeper dive into their concept, lyrics, production, and even choreography, I came to the conclusion that Eyes One is impermanence. Of course the group itself was impermanent, that's obviously no secret, but Eyes One conveys that process of impermanence. Discovering, experiencing, dissolving, and thus reminiscing. They are the memory you so desperately want to relive, but time doesn't take requests. In this way, Eyes One was beautiful because they help us remember that nothing lasts forever. This isn't just a lesson that can be applied to K-pop, but more obviously life itself. 
Eyes One the flower is long gone. However, just like a dandelion, the seeds ended up flowing through the wind currents of the industry and landed in new locations, sowing bright futures for new artists. Ive, Le Seraphim, Quan Unbi, Li Cheyun, Zhou Yuri, Choi Yena, just a few examples of flowers that have emerged from the withered memories of Eyes One. These artists, their futures would be put in jeopardy if Eyes One never disbanded. Sure, we can envision a future where Eyes One extends their contracts and the flower lives to see a fruitful career, but why dwell on ifs when we can experience the nows? If Eyes One never disbanded, there's a very realistic possibility we would never get songs like Love Dive from Ive, Anti-Fragile from Le Seraphim. Right now, we have two incredibly promising girl groups formed from the ashes of Eyes One that have already taken the industry by storm. Soloists who have carved out promising futures, actresses, and music show hosts. Eyes One are still very much dominating the industry, just not in the way they used to. The other day I was playing a game called Terra Nil on Steam. It's basically a reverse factory builder where you essentially fix a desolate environment and reintroduce life and nature back into it. At one point you were forced to set nature ablaze to, you know, raise the temperature of the surrounding atmosphere, burning down flowers and trees, and at first I was like, why would you do this? This seems very counterintuitive. That's when I remembered that low intensity fires can lead to rich soil development. And when I watched the rainstorm that occurred after I heated the atmosphere, replace this desolate, burned down land with even more beautiful nature, I realized this is just Eyes One. I wouldn't say Eyes One necessarily burned down, but when they disbanded, a lot of netizens were rightfully in panic after witnessing the curse that fell the ex IOI members. But the ashes of Eyes One ended up serving as fertile ground for these young artists. Eyes One also serves as a stark warning to other K pop companies don't dawdle with time. Don't waste the energy of your idols, staff, production crew, and fans if you can't craft a stable concept. There are so many groups out now who can barely put out a three minute song, let alone a cohesive message or sound. Every Korean comeback from Eyes One had a purpose to serve. They didn't let time melt away. They took advantage of what little of it they ended up having. This is a huge criticism I have of how Wake One has handled Kepler. They have not established a defined concept for that group and have literally let time just slip away from the group, releasing mediocre comeback after mediocre comeback with no direction. My criticism is aimed purely at the management of that group and not the members. I think the members are incredibly talented and I think if they were under a different company, they would be able to have a lot more success than they do. You even turn around to see big three companies completely wasting away the talents of their members with inconsistent production, shoddy lyricism, and undercooked choreography. I have one group in mind, and I could speak on that for an hour. I won't. JYP has heard enough from me. These companies treat their groups not as flowers, but weeds, used to suck the money and care out of their fans, and in return, we get what? A half-baked EP? A tour to drain our wallets? This is at no fault of the idols themselves. They are merely a cog in the machine to these companies. In relation to K-pop, I do miss Eyes One because they represented what a K-pop group should be. The amount of time, care, and effort that went into every piece of that group. I said this earlier and let me repeat myself here. Eyes One seems like the perfect girl group, and in some ways they were. Which is why seeing them fade into the sunset was so hard for fans. But this impermanence matters. Their impact will be felt for not years, but potentially generations to come. When I reflect now on Eyes One, I'm not filled with sadness, but with hope. Not for some reformation as fans anticipate. Instead, I look forward to seeing what groups like Ive and Le Seraphim will bring to the table. I doubt the idols like Chaewon, Wonyoung, Yujin, and Sakura in those groups would be even half the performers they are now if they were never in Eyes One. Eyes One gave them the platform they needed to develop their idol skills. Eyes One didn't just bless us with great music when they were a group, but also provided us with a bright future in K-pop. Flowers spread their seeds to ensure a future for their species. Eyes One ended up metaphorically spreading its seeds upon disbandment to guarantee a prosperous future for K-pop. 
In the end, when Eyes One disbanded, they didn't lose any notoriety or popularity. In fact, you could argue the inverse occurred. Over the following year, it almost seemed as if Eyes One never disbanded in the first place. Netizens still talked about their releases and shared videos of their variety show content. It's common to see groups gain very fleeting popularity after the disbandment of said group because typically it's a hot topic. But Eyes One's disbandment ended up pushing past just another news headline. This has permeated to this day. Eyes One is still discussed just as much as they were back in 2020. This Eyes One video itself was originally a viewer voted video. All the way back in, I believe, late September, I held a poll on which video you guys wanted to see, and this was the video that won out narrowly over some other choices. I believe a factor in Eyes One's popularity staying quite strong is the fact that many of the idols from said group are very active within the industry now and have been seen on shows together, they've spoken about how they still have a group chat. When BTS released Proof and subsequently began to slow down their content production, the members began debuting solo as they needed to enlist over time. BTS aren't the same as Eyes One in which they haven't disbanded, but the hiatus of BTS as a group led us to getting incredible music from the members. J-Hope's impeccable Jack in the Box album, August D dropping the most heart-wrenching B-side of 2023, RM's amazing Indigo album, Jin performing with Coldplay, V is set to be on IU's next album, Jungkook and Jimin embraced Western pop themes, and we even got a collab between Usher and Jungkook. The same thing has essentially happened with Eyes One, except they actually disbanded. I think that Eyes One can teach us that all of our favorite groups one day will come to an end. I will genuinely shed grown man tears when I get the notification that Red Velvet is disbanding. I will curl up in a corner and become a recluse for weeks after I see the headlines of Dreamcatcher parting ways. Ignoring my over-exaggeration, well, I will be crying when Red Velvet disbands and... I will also probably cry when Dreamcatcher disbands, so besides the point, when those groups disband, I believe that those are times for celebration. Not because I hate Red Velvet or Dreamcatcher, they are literally my top two favorite girl groups of all time, but because of what they've done for not only the industry, but for me as a fan. I am so thankful to Red Velvet for helping get me further into the rabbit hole that is K-pop, and Dreamcatcher single-handedly changed the way I view girl groups. Impermanence ultimately forces us to grow as individuals and live in the present. After this deep dive, going back and re-experiencing Eyes One and what they stood for, how the group left such a legacy, I have gained a further appreciation for the short time I have on this planet. I know that may sound morally intense for a K-pop video, but it's the truth. Don't take every day for granted. I've had some really fantastic experiences in my life, and while I look back at those memories fondly, I also look ahead to the great opportunities I have. As I have matured post high school, I have further realized my love for art itself, not just music, but animation and storytelling. I first came to this realization while sitting in a little study pod up in my college during the late winter. The recent Demon Slayer season had dropped, and I was itching to continue following the story of Tanjiro. I was watching the final fight between Tanjiro and Tengen versus Gyutaro. The fight is infamous as the animation and sound design is top tier, maybe one of the most beautiful sequences in anime history. If I am able to, I will put a sequence in here. <laughs> At one point, I remember just crying, not out of sadness, no, there was no sadness to be found in this scene. If anything, it was one of triumph and glory. Instead, I found tears gently sifting down my cheeks as a result of the art I was witnessing, the colors, the animation, the tension, the score. It was also beautiful to me.
that moment really changed me as a person because I started to view art differently. If you asked Teiju back in early high school what Eyes One stood for, first he would probably say something like, what's Eyes One, because he wasn't a fan of them then, but he would probably answer with some surface level explanation. Quote, well, they made dance pop music with colorful visuals, end quote. There's nothing inherently wrong with that answer, but it's a bit shallow, ankle deep in the pool. If you ask Teiju now what Eyes One represents, well, I just made an over hour long video expressing that very notion. When I look at Eyes One now, I see a group filled with hardworking idols. I teased this way earlier in the video, but there was an incident that involved the rigging of members into the final Eyes One lineup. This is the same incident that would lead to X1's disbandment. There were showcases, promotions, I believe the Blue Eyes album also had to be pushed back. It was a really big deal, and because, you know, we can assume some of the members of Eyes One were rigged into the group, there were of course netizens throwing out names saying they didn't deserve to be in the group. I've heard Joe Yuri, Chewan, Cheon, Yujin, Nako, like I've literally heard every single member at one point come up in a, they were rigged into the lineup. I say all this because it's pretty evident that those people say those things in order to downplay the effort that this group actually put into being a k-pop group those members worked incredibly hard to get where they were by their disbandment there are not a lot of k-pop groups that could pull off the choreos that they were doing and even if there were members that were rigged in people ended up loving the final lineup wanted to get that out of the way because i just feel like there's always people nagging online about how x member was rigged in like who cares bro it's been years eyes one has this really intricate concept that helped me appreciate k-pop as a whole and the amount of effort that goes into establishing a sound having consistent thematic comebacks Eyes One displays how beautiful the process of impermanence is and how it plays a key role in our growth as not only just fans of music, but people. I hope this video to some degree made you see something you may not have before in Eyes One, or maybe I'm just now introducing you to Eyes One. Either way, if you learned anything at all during this video, it has ultimately served its purpose. I won't be a K-tuber forever, I too, just like Eyes One, will eventually fade away. However, I have taken inspiration from them in a way to further spread positivity on this platform. This is ultimately why I decided to uplift smaller content creators, pull the attention away from my channel. I want to make KTube a more positive space, even with my little essay videos. So when I do leave, I won't have any regrets and I can watch other content creators do what they love, share their opinions without the algorithm burying them. Eyes One has led me to appreciate this channel even more than I did before. I appreciate every person who has subscribed to this channel, viewed my content, liked my content, and said hi to me in person. Ironically, this video speaking on the fickleness of time is quite long itself, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't want to waste any more of your precious time. Go out and discover something, make a video, read a book, live your life. Don't take those moments for granted, as small as they may be. Just know that I'm in the corner rooting for you every step of the way. I'm speaking to you not as Teiju, the online persona, but as Robbie. I've decided I'm going to experience my life outside of YouTube for a bit. I'm going to leave this platform in a limbo state for a while. If this is the last time you view one of my videos, well, I appreciate you, and I hope you enjoyed this one. If you didn't, well, thanks for at least giving it a chance. This video is well over an hour, and there's still so much I want to talk about in regards of this group, but I think it's time to leave Eyes One in the past for a little while. Every day, the impermanence of life can be such a terrifying thing, yet beautiful at the same time. And I think Eyes One has ended up becoming the perfect example of how beautiful impermanence really is.